Hello. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Well, you know, I want to start off first by saying thank you for joining us. I can't really think of someone better to help us kick off um, Austin's first ever Social Media Week. Um, so thank you, Gay, for um, sharing your thoughts with us today. Great, thanks. Um, for those of you who don't know, and I'm, I'm sure that's not very many people, but Gay here is um, CEO and founder of T3, and T3 is um, a, a creative agency. Technology-fueled is, is how they describe themselves. Um, and we'll get to learn a little bit more about what exactly that means and some of um, Gay's experience over the years uh, leading customers you know, based on data and explorations into social media. Um, I would love to go ahead and kick off and you know, ask, I think, no better question to start this discussion. Um, you know, how have you seen social media uh, influence advertising and um, influence what you've done for your customers over the years? Uh, T3 has always been kind of what's next. And we, I would say, pretty much push our clients to look over the edge and see how we can take in any new medium, no matter what it is, and use it toward the good of building their brand. Uh, we actually have a study that we are in the middle of now, an ongoing study called the Useful Brand. And we like to take our brands to a place where the consumer or that end buyer really is engaged. So what better than social media? Um, this was something that we started dipping our toe into way back. I'm going to tell you almost 15 years ago before anyone was doing anything, maybe 14, 13, 12. And I've got some pretty funny stories just to take you down memory lane if you'll indulge me in a couple of those. Uh, I'll never forget when we were the first to put a brand on Facebook and JC Penney was our client and we said we think you need to be on Facebook and, th and they said no that's just for teens that's not for us we ended up being very successful with Facebook that was just one thing but another thing that was really kind of funny back in the day is that you remember all the chats and all that stuff uh, I, my cousin worked for us at the time and we would put her on a plane send her to LA and she would sit on Cindy Crawford's couch and when they would do these live chats it was Katie my cousin who was speaking for Cindy uh, Cindy would tell her stuff to do but Katie was running the content even way back then another kind of unbelievable story was many years ago before the Windows Phone was going to launch, Steve Ballmer, CEO of Microsoft at the time, was at the Barcelona Me Media Mobile Festival and, and Summit and just announced the Windows Phone. And no one was ready to do it yet. The announcement was not really baked. So we had almost nine months of what do you do with this audience that's out there to keep them engaged. So we literally built from scratch our own media network and we had up to 150,000 engaged people worldwide. They were phone geeks, people all over the world. And the way it culminated and we were able to use this is that they were dealing with the Microsoft engineers and they were really helping to build and design the actual features of the phone. So at the end of it, when the phone finally launched, we had a big celebration. We brought in people from all over the world who had been big influencers at the time on what happened. So, so many stories in the past. Uh, you know, there's another little company that makes uh, green tractors with yellow logos on it. And uh, <laughs> they, we found through social media, Flickr, all these places, that they were one of the most beloved brands in the country, and not even that, but in the world. And so many, many years ago, we saw this and we started aggregating, like, who's watching this brand and who loves this brand? Uh, we tried to get them to do a control center where we could start to manage and work with all these lovers out there and really amplify the brand. But it was in the early days of social media and they, like so many big corporations, were terrified of what would happen if the cat got out of the bag and if the consumer was in charge. And so it never really happened. Uh, and I think that was what was kind of the early, if I have to talk about the early days, the biggest fear was who was controlling the content. And what you would see was some of the corporate PR folks just latching down on that and afraid to let everything get out and be out of control. Uh, so as we've evolved, and as you are, many of the young uh, characters in the room here know that now that's just kind of a thing of the past and, and that we use that user-generated content to the good. 
and it's not something to fear anymore. Um, I could tell many more stories, but that's some of the old days stuff that, uh, but we were excited to be a part of it. And we started to see that engagement time equal more sales. Because the big, big issue around social media then, and still to an extent now, is how do you monetize it? You know, what is it really worth? What is engagement time? Uh, what is my brand loyalty just because I've spent more time with you? And we found, especially again with JCPenney on a holiday site, the more that the client or the customer became engaged and was doing these little social projects kind of outside of the site look, um, they bought more stuff. And so those were exciting times. I've got a bunch of stories where we monetized it, but that was the big deal. Like, you know, how do we make money with this and what is it worth versus just doing traditional media? Well, you know, it's clear that you guys were early innovators in this space. And so we love hearing these stories. Um, and, you know, many of us know that it's often the people behind a company or the organization that are really leading the charge on these type of activities. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about um, the idea of being an entrepreneur and, and, you know, by design, hiring the right types of people to help push your company forward? All right. Um, one funny little uh, thing I need to tell you before I talk about that is that we looked at a Microsoft study not too long ago, a recent one, and our attention span has gone down to 8.25 seconds uh, since the year 2000, and it was up to what, well, I think about, where were we, oh, 12 seconds in, in 2000, and now we're at 8.25. I found that a goldfish has a nine second attention span, and my husband's always described me as having the attention span of a tsetse fly. So what this says is you've got to be bold, direct, and, you've, and brands have got to grab while they can or you're gone. And uh, I think that's one of the things at T3 that we're always really searching for. And since I'm an entrepreneur, I love that spirit inside of a company. And I've had, I started T3 almost 28 years ago. We'll be 28 years old on March 1st, uh, which is unbelievable to me how many payrolls I've made and all the things through the years. But um, it's, it's a very exciting company uh, because we do like to look around the corner at what's next. And we're not afraid to dive into it. And we find people who are bold and curious and interested and not afraid to make a mistake here and there because we're trying something new. I, I cannot tell you how many times we've had a project flying around or we prototype something that never been done before. And, and that's the kind of folks we always look for at T3. Those people who take it as, hey, this is my company. This is my team. This is my opportunity to really shine. And uh, there's no one saying, no, you can't do that, unless, of course, we all, the team decides that's not the right direction to go. But no one is squelched for having a great idea. And uh, I prize that to this very day. It's a big part of who we are. Um, well, it segues into um, another part of our conversation today that I'd, I'd love to take us into um, female entrepreneurship. You know, from one female entrepreneur to another, mm -hmm. we'd love to hear more about um, just your direction. And, you know, quickly, I, I mentioned this to you when we, when we met last week, but I first met Gay um, six or seven years ago when I was new to, <clears throat> new to the Austin market. Mm -hmm. um, and you were very inspirational to me when I was out in the crowd listening to you speak then. Um, so could you talk to us a little bit more about you know, why you feel that drive to inspire other women to, to lead and, and follow their own entrepreneurial dreams? Well, I, I believe women are great leaders. Uh, I, I think that women also have an incredible ability to be the head of or the impetus for these high-functioning teams. And that's how the innovation society is working to me today. It's not so much the top-down management as it is these very high-functioning teams that get incredible things done. And women are good at that. Uh, I think one of the things that upsets me is if you read the, look at the media and you see what's out there, women look like we're always failing because it's a numbers game. Well, we have... 20 male CEOs of major company, technology company, but there are only two women. We have X number of men on corporate boards and only so many women. And I think that we're just being kind of beat to death with this whole thing that women aren't out there being successful, and I call bullshit on that. Women are successful. You're building things. You're doing things. Yeah. <laughs> 
And so continue with that. If you want to be a CEO someday, if you want to be truly a leader, that's your choice. Uh, but I don't think that defines greatness. Uh, for me, it was something that I just had to do because I actually got mad at my boss and quit back in 1989. I had a $16,000 IRA and full of craziness and a little courage, and I started the company. Uh, but it's been a great ride for me because uh, I have met so many women because of the position I'm in now that have done some remarkable things, both on the corporate side and on the uh, literally entrepreneurial side. But you have to think, it's up to you, it's a choice. But many women don't want to scale their business. And so that concerns me some. I would, if you're gonna go for it, I'd like for you to have the appetite for the risk to move it up and say, look, I can be a $5 million company, a $10 million company of 15, 20, 30. Uh, and, and really, if you, if you have the stomach for it, I think it's women are great leaders. And I've done some things, and I think you were gonna ask about it, that I don't think men would do, right? Um, I'd love to ask the crowd, I heard Sam in his talk previous um, ask how many founders are in the room right now. Raise your hand if you're a founder. Good. And how many people right. want to be founders that aren't founders yet? <laughs> That's good. Great. Go for it. Yes, we'll push you towards that. Don't be scared. Um, I, I also want to ask a, um, some of you may notice the, the bump in my belly. I've got a, a growing baby boy. Um, so one of the stories that Gay shared with, with me you know, years back was about her T3 and under program. And mm -hmm. this was really inspirational. And you know, if you don't want to be a mother, that's OK. This was a great way to inspire your employees and, mm -hmm. and your teammates. So if you could share with us today about the T3 and under program, I think it's a great story. It's one of the best things I think I've ever done. And I almost stumbled upon it um, many years ago, about 20 a little over 22 years ago, we were a much smaller company and we only uh, had about 36 folks, I think. And four of the women got pregnant very close at the same time. I never knew how that happened, but it did. I said, was there an ice storm or something I missed? But anyway, they were all pregnant and so we decided that we would just say, hey, why don't you bring the babies to the office with you? This is not daycare, but we'll help you take care of them and just go back to work. Well, they tried it, they did it. They didn't want to, they were afraid. But you fast forward 22 years later, and we've had over 100 little babies come through the office. And dads have participated as well. We've got some great stories of dads who did this. So mom and dad, we allow them to just bring the child up there. They take care of them. But it's amazing how well I think these kids have done. And I'm reading more and more studies about that early childhood development around language, reading to children, and having adult conversations around them at an early age is incredible incredible what it can do to their trajectory to really learn. And our children have been very socialized. And sometimes one of the parents will come back and say, hey, Levi is the mayor of his kindergarten class, or you know that kind of thing. I'm really proud of the kids. And we actually had two of the first T3 and under babies intern at the office this past summer. And when I walked in and saw them, I just had tears in my eyes because they were in the really side by side and bassinets together as infants. And here they were back as successful young college students uh, in interning at T3 and earning that spot. So it's something that I love and say, everybody should try this if you could possibly pull it off because it's, uh, and I can't tell you what it does for the culture, the goodwill, and the well-being of these little children. It's a really neat story. Um, okay, let's move into, this is a tough conversation sometimes, work-life balance. You know, there's a lot of demands in the world we live in today. We're constantly connected. So can you just share some advice, you know, even being a mother yourself, um, when it's your career and you're a mom and you've got everything in the world going on, what type of tips do you have um, about following your dreams and, and balancing it, it all? Okay, well, I'm gonna start off with my real feeling and that is that there is no such thing and we need to quit, quit talking about like this because how many times were men confronted with saying, what is your work-life balance situation right now? It's always directed to women. It's one of these things like the numbers game I was telling you that make women feel guilty. We don't need more guilt heaped on us, please. So, you know, my mom did enough of that So, <laughs> uh, with my own children. But um, I think that the interesting thing that's the difference today is when my children were growing up, I was working, I was an entrepreneur, and I was, you know, 
constantly concerned about clients and what was going on, but I didn't have a device hooked to my hand all day long. And so my daughter now and sons will tell you that when they were growing up that they missed me. Sometimes I wasn't there. I couldn't attend everything, but when I was there, I was all in. And you know, when we did the bedtime book reading, we did all that stuff, I was really paying attention to them. And so I think now what we do have to do is realize that sometimes work is gonna take you all the way over here, Sometimes it's family way over here because there's times when your mother is dying or your child is sick and throwing up at school and you gotta go deal with it. I mean, all those things you have to deal with. So work kind of gets pushed aside a little bit, then you, it goes back over here. There is no real balance, but I do warn everybody to take time to make sure that when you're connected with your family, loved ones, significant other, be tuned in to them at that time and, not, and just put that thing down for a minute. It will wait. And if it's a real crisis, someone will find you. So next I'd like to ask um, if you could give us recommendations and you know, from your own examples, how do people go ahead and establish a brand voice for themselves and especially an identity for themselves in this world of social media? Well, it certainly changed. You know, I um, grew up in a little town in East Texas, and if I wasn't in the local newspaper once a week, my mother thought I had failed. So I guess that was the social media of the day. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, we we built. I've built a brand around myself uh, because I'm an entrepreneur. It's very important because you become the symbol for the brand. The entire brand, like T3, surrounds me with their smarts and their ideas and what they do. Uh, T3 stands for the think tank, by the way, T3, the think tank. <laughs> and that's the way we solve problems and, and come up with new ideas and rapid prototype. But my brand and who I am has a lot to do with the culture, with the ethics, with the way we do business. and. I have to protect that as much as possible. So today in social media, you know, I've had a few times where I made some goofs. Oh, oh goodness, one time, <laughs> early days of online video, um, we did a video of me like I was shooting off in a rocket going up into the next fiscal year, and I got beat to death on social media. They thought I was a complete witch and an idiot, but you know, we made a few mistakes. Along the way though, I've really learned that as I've changed as a person, and uh, being CEO, I'm not president of the company, I'm not in every day-to-day -day decision anymore, I'm doing things that build our brand. So I'm um, uh, authoring a book that's gonna come out in about less than a year. Um, I'm an artist, again, after many, many years, and I've been working on that. I had, had two shows in New York after not painting for almost 37 years. It's been incredible uh, to do that. So social media has become a huge part of what we do. We got three and a half, my T3 team just almost on the backswing, got three and a half million social media impressions for my art show alone. And uh, that was very exciting. Some of it was paid, some of it you know, was just earned and out there uh, based on what we were able to do with uh, you know, just the Twitter stuff and Instagram and my Facebook and all that, and you add it all together, LinkedIn, and we had a pretty significant show around that. Um, now moving forward as an author, it's gonna be a huge part of my brand. Um, and so we're inviting people to have their content come into mine and have more of a dialogue. And that's what is so exciting about social media, if it's used correctly. And you think about TV, you know, I grew up in the TV era, and uh, TV is a great medium. I mean, visuals, video is a great medium. But today, it is almost useless to run all these expensive television spots if you don't have the digital strategy that runs behind it. And you see this. I mean, um, pre-Super Bowl, during Super Bowl, whatever they're doing, and all the things that are happening around these expensive TV spots makes sense. So again, a brand is really trying to reach out every day to make sure that those connections are alive and well and that we don't lose you. In fact, that's what our social media team is called at T3, it's connections. It's about making those ongoing connections and not just telling everybody what we want them to hear. Did I get off the, the panel? No, I think we're right on time. I, you, I think that, again, segues into another question. Um, you know, a question that, I guess, arises a lot in, in the world of social, um, you know, I think a lot of people agree that social is a great testing ground or place mm -hmm. to run media and, and see how people engage. Um, 
how would you recommend or guide people today with their investments when they're looking at traditional media versus social media? Um, I think the way I've always believed about this, and it's um, everything that comes our way that's a new medium is worth exploring if it has traction, if it is building the brand, if it is making, like I said, our brands, the ones we work with, more useful. So it's not just funny and telling, it's, it's sometimes it's really doing things that's gonna make your life better and easier. Um, I, I think that um, all media is valid. It has a place and time, and we've said this for years. But today, uh, and as we look forward, there's going to be, I think, even more of a groundswell of how social media is delivered. And we all know this. I'm sure, how many in this room would consider yourself an influencer? A couple. Uh, my daughter is going down this path, and I've learned a lot more about it. I mean, we've certainly worked with some pretty interesting people uh, through T3 where we see they're out there having a voice and talking about some of the brands that we support and how we can engage them to be part of the media solution. Uh, my daughter is working for two PR firms in New York and a, a magazine in London where she's out there putting out content for that and they pay her. So if I thought my daughter would have a job doing that 10 years ago, you could have knocked me over with a feather, no way. you know. But she's, she's been beginning to really build this in a following and it's I think it's the future. We love user-generated content. It's something that, I'll, if you'll let me regress for one second, I'll tell you a story years and years ago. Uh, we were working for Marriott Hotels, all, all the brands. And one of their brands happens to be Renaissance Hotels. Uh, we decided to put a contest online uh, on their site where you, the user out there, could post photographs of your very favorite vacation, your very favorite place you went or your vacation. We were placing, now going back to how these media can work together, we were placing a good bit of print advertising in Condé Nast publications. So we were able to negotiate a free trip to Paris through Condé Nast because of the print and some online that we were placing, and we put it out there. No one had any idea what kind of response we would get. It was overwhelming. And this is before the days of the technology that allows us to aggregate this and filter this stuff. So it was a hand-picked, Every photo, every piece of content that came in had to be curated. And we had to make sure that it wasn't obscene or was not off-brand and all that stuff. But we had thousands of people participate. And of course, the trip was given out to uh, a family. And it was just great. But boy, the light bulb went on me, went on for me years ago that people want to share stuff. And they're not afraid to share their own intimate, well, not intimate, but you know, their own personal experience. So I, I just think it's incredible, you know, how how this has began to evolve more and more. And you're going to see, I think, uh, user-generated content go through the roof. Uh, I'm on a board of directors of a company called Monotype. We bought a company called Olapic, and that's what they're all about. It's a company based in New York. I don't know if anyone's heard of them, but they are doing the things like on West Elm, where if you put in your dog sitting on the couch that you bought and all that cool stuff, then they turn them into little videos and they do stuff. And they, it's so much of what they're doing to build that brand is, is uh, user UGC. Um, so to us, that's the future, how to get employees to be more engaged in UGC for like your company. So if the big companies, how do they protect Participate. Uh, they're out there commingling with people on how do you get some of the goodness of that, you know, into your social media stream. Well, I think I'm going to ask one more question and then I'll open it up for um, questions from the crowd. Um, it sounds like you are pretty much surrounded by this new way of communicating um, with your daughter and um, children being involved with the business. Um, and leading T3, is there, are there any other changes specifically with influencer marketing or I guess how has it evolved or what should we look for to the future with this, with this marketing? Well, you think about it, it all of a sudden, you know, we, we used to talk about how there were just a few different mediums out there. And basically when I started in this industry, it was pretty easy. Uh, you know, you had radio, television, print, and that was divided between newspaper and magazines, uh, direct mail. Uh, outdoor. Basically, that was your bag of tricks, right? 
Then we got into, well, all things internet interactive, and we had the online advertising, and you had all the other pieces. And I'll never forget a day uh, many, many years ago, we were sitting in the office, and one guy stood up and drew a chart. He put the internet in the middle, and all these other mediums were circling around, and everybody went, oh, really? That's not going to go that way. And look what's happened. So, you know, I, I, here we go, moving forward with all the mediums, and then you bring in the influencers, then more UGC, and every brand's dealing with that. So what it does is splinters the media opportunities into thousands of points of light, basically. And you've got to find these people, and sometimes that's the challenge. But where you put your money is going to be more and more complicated, I believe, um, because of the, the people out there who are really building it. And, and we all like that because supposedly, and now that becomes a bit disingenuous like native advertising, um, these people are a little more genuine than just me pushing content. Still, yes, they're paid, and that's gonna be out there. Uh, we like a genuine, authentic voice. So I would trust them, though, just about as much as I would a native ad that shows up someplace, which scares me sometimes, and also just what's the push out uh, in other mediums. So, so I think it's gonna get more and more complicated. There's too many people out there that can, and then where? Do, how do you pick them, and how, who's really moving the needle? So the analytics you put behind that is now also what's so incredible, which we had very little of, you know, many years ago. Well, thank you. Um, you can also send through questions with SMWI Wonder hashtag. Um, but I'd love to go ahead and ask the crowd um, if you have some questions for Gay. Come on, guys. There's one. <laughs> what recommendations would you give to women that wanted to change mindset and go to the role opportunity in a company? Do you, I, I assume it doesn't arrive in your lap that you come no. up with that idea or you have to always get to a certain level that you're given those considerations? So just to repeat the question, we are looking for advice for women that want to take on an entrepreneurial role with an organization. Yeah. Well, first of all, you have to see if the company has an appetite for that kind of thinking. And you really need to evaluate and think about how decisions are made, uh, how teams are treated, and, and all of that. I think high-functioning teams allow for that. Um, but you can also start to pull little tricks yourself. You know, uh, I always did kind of these entrepreneurial things. I worked for other people for 10 years before I started my own company. And I would come up with initiatives and things that I could kind of run with. And if I could get uh, the top leadership to buy in and that I was dedicated to it, I got to do a lot of interesting things along the way that I think prepared me later to be an entrepreneur. So, um, you know, you, you kind of make up this stuff and <laughs> you say, well, what would, what would be really good for the company? And kind of say, hey, I'll raise my hand and I'll go and try to fix that. Uh, or I'll do that. I always say what your best job is is what's not on your job description. You gotta think outside of it, and that's how entrepreneurs think, and that's how entrepreneurial organizations work. That's great advice. Back here. Okay, I think the question was, what is the impact of fake news sites on today's media? Is that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it's almost, it's, it's, it's dangerous in some ways because I think it's, it goes back to me. It's almost like native advertising to me. It's where you are taking the, what might have been a trusted viewer and breaking all their trust because there they are thinking, well, this was a, a founded news source, or, you know, this is a magazine I like to read, this is an online site, and it's manipulating that audience. So I think we have to be all a little more cautious about where these things are coming from. Um, you can't believe everything you read at all, and, and um, it, it just puts more onus on the, on the consumer and the reader. So it's, uh, and, you know, the money's going to be made there, too. So... Yeah, I think it's really incumbent on advertisers to find out who's behind this and what are they doing to validate their information. And because if I put an ad in one of these deals, which I hope I haven't, where I'm putting a, one of our brands at risk out there of being associated with something that's completely false, and then the reader loses trust, and once I break the trust, um, you know, it's hard to get you back. 
So we have to be very diligent about it. Um, again, I don't like native advertising much either, but that's become the way of the world. I think we have a question back here. With stories like the Uber female employee coming to light, how do we as women support each other while staying competitive? Well, my opinion on women staying together, if you want to talk about women, is that when you give a hand to somebody else and you help lift up somebody, it comes back to you in just spades. Uh, I, I believe, you know, I've laughed all my life because uh, I did work for some pretty tough women along the way, and I have some scars on the top of my hands, and they're from the stiletto heels that were going in as I was climbing up the ladder. Um, <laughs> But I, I've changed my thinking about that. We don't need to compete with each other. We need to help each other. And when that happens, all the boats rise. There's enough good work for everybody out there uh, and for smart people and great people. My opinion has always been, since I kind of hit the curve and started moving into kind of a, a larger role and meeting so many effective, smart women, is they've all, so many have helped me. I, I try to help them. And I spend a lot of my time personally going out and speaking to high school, university students, uh, men and women, but mainly a lot of women, uh, as well as you know women in organizations to say, look, I, I want you to win. We need you. And especially, I wrote an article for Fortune recently, uh, it was a STEM article, and it says, why should women be in STEM? And the bottom line thesis of the article is that women have a great ability to be empathetic, to think of how things can be useful and caring and working. And if we're not sitting at the table, when all these decisions are being made and when new products and services are coming around, we may lose that side of the equation. So I've been a big promoter lately of saying, women, just get in there, hang in there. And you know, if you don't like coding, that's okay. Get someone else to help you, but don't lose that seat at the table. Asking for advice uh, for female leaders who are constantly playing in a guy's game. Um, I actually was asked the other day, no, asked, I was in a meeting and he said, well, I think you're still dealing with a man's world. And I couldn't believe it, but um, yeah, I'd love to hear your perspective there. I kind of wanted to be like, have you opened up your eyes recently? I mean, I, you know, it's, it's a very progressive world we're in, so. Um, it yeah, is, and, and I think for both men and women, it's how are we gonna work together more effectively on what I'm calling these innovative, high-performing teams. Um, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. There's nobody who's got the corner on the truth. So bring your best to, to that table, ask for more, don't be discouraged. And I've been the only woman in the room so many times, I cannot tell you. And here's a little trick. So I'm this little feisty Texan, and um, sometimes I go in and I, I can be a little disarming because I don't think that I'm really gonna come down and put the kibosh on stuff, but you know, I kind of, like a steel magnolia come in, and it's worked really well. <laughs> um, but I've also had to be, you know, Keep up with everything and be relevant. Be very smart. I, you know, I work harder than probably a lot of guys do at that, just because it's it's the only way to really make sure that you're not scoffed off is not important. But you don't want to feel that way. You know, I've always gone in and thought I have every reason to be here, and even if I was a little intimidated or a little afraid. I'll get over it because once you've done it a few times, you'll feel like, yeah, I need to be there. I can, I have something to contribute. But you can't go to these meetings or be in these rooms and not say anything. And I'm really tired of this whole man interruption thing going on out there and these microaggressions. Good Lord. I mean, you know, get over it. Don't let them interrupt you. I, you know, I've interrupted guys before if I've really felt passionate about something. Um, so you got to be, you know, watch that behavior in the room and not be the wounded one, but say, hell yeah, I'm supposed to be in this room and I have something to say. Um, so you got to got to play it like that. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> it is. Sure. 
How do you get a mentor or mentors? Yep. All right. Well, and things like this. You show up places, you meet people, you try to meet people or find people that inspire you. And you, ne you never know, if you position it the right way, someone may take you on to raise for a little while. Uh, when you do that though, they have to feel like they're getting something back. I have all kinds of people that I quietly mentor here and there, and but they always give me things. This is one you won't believe. So I have this woman I met. She was waiting. Uh, she was waiting tables at a, a restaurant I go to in New York, and she said some funny stuff. And I said, "You're really clever." And she says, "Yeah, I'm studying to be a comedian. I'm in a really good comedy school here." And uh, she said, "But I need to have courage to do this and that." And I said, "Look, I'll meet you once a quarter." and we can talk about stuff. But she always makes me laugh, and she has good advice for me. So it's kind of like, there, there's gotta be a, a symbiotic relation there, ships there of somehow, because busy people who are really busy that you want them to mentor you, they're, they're getting pulled a lot of different directions. And you want, even if it's a small bit of their time, the best of their time. Uh, it's hard, you have gotta just keep after it, and don't be discouraged. If people say no, you're five people closer to someone who's gonna say yes. <laughs> We've got time for maybe one or two more. <laughs> Behind me? We would love some advice on how should small agencies balance time spent on their growth versus time spent on clientele content. Okay, well, I think <laughs> content there is interesting. Now, you're talking about just the growth of your agency or your business, correct? Um, you have to be growing all the time. But one thing that's been fortunate for me is that I'm not owned by anybody. We're independent, and so I don't have a blowtorch to my butt every month saying that I've got to get this much margin on top. We can grow at a pace that we feel is good. Uh, I've always felt that if you grow too fast, the wheels are gonna fall off. You've gotta take care of the people that are there for you, that have hired you, and you don't want to take your eye off them. As Daryl Roy used to say, you gotta dance with the one who brung you. And you gotta pay attention to them because they can go be lured off tomorrow by somebody else who is paying more attention to them. So it's a balance. This is one time where I say there is a balance because you need to constantly be looking for new business, bringing new stuff in, because even in the best day you have, you can lose business at no fault of your own. So you've gotta have stuff in the pipeline, you gotta have it moving. But take care of those people that are there, grow their business, and you'll grow with them. And that's been a big part of what we've done, is just we get in, we do a good job, year by year, and you grow the business, and uh, it's a great new business tool, really, is your own clients, right? Anyone else? Well, thank you, Gay. We really appreciate your time and advice, and again, being an inspiration for all of us here in Austin and kicking off our first ever social media week. Well, thank you, and for the guys out there, I really love working with men. I don't want to come across. <laughs> I love men, and I've had some amazing people, and we have amazing people at T3 who are just incredible guys, so I don't want to come across as like this kind of feminazi person, but I do uh, champion women because I think they're a great part of everything and uh, we need to keep a good group of men and women out there coming up with new innovative ideas that push toward uh, the greatest social media strategies, right? Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you.